Okay, cool. Hey, Duncan, welcome. So, um, thank you all for for coming once again. I think uh, the, the book is getting a little better, in my view, in the, in this in the sense that we've reached a point now where a lot of things that were unclear are coming into focus, and I think that uh, I'm hitting some points of clarity, which is refreshing. I will say though that I have a weird symptomatic relationship to this book. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you all, but it just if there's something about it that um, that mesmerizes maybe a little bit. Um, and I think that one example of that um, enigmatic quality of the book is that 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 clean structuralism that he's able to present in chapter one in the first 18 or so pages we looked at last time. Um, where he sort of is, is capable of <clears throat> creating a grand theory of sacrifice, right? Um, and I, I admire that, that, that cleanness of um, the structural impulse. Um, and you'll see that as we go, right? Especially when he looks at Greek tragedy. Um, I think actually <clears throat> his reading of uh, Oedipus is pretty interesting actually, right? Um, it, it was at that point that things started to really come together for me. Um, so yeah, so I felt like this opening quote from page 32 is extremely uh, pertinent in the sense that, um, you know, we often think of the sacred through Protestantized lens. In, in what sense? Um, we think about it through the, 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 the prism of possessive individualism, right? So the sacred is sort of that um, kind of Christian interior life, right? That kind of theme, right? Um, and clearly what I like about Gerard's uh, thesis on the sacred is that actually the sacred must be understood from the distinction of pure and impure, right? Um, and so he has this example of how in a pandemic, um, the one who is infected, uh, it's, it's, it's necessary that another human who was infected but then cured function as a mediator or a guide to expel the, the, the impure. But because the impure of the disease, um, even before the discovery of microbiology, um, um, emanates from the sacred, the sacred has both, um, well, the sacred actually is, is that which imposes the, the reign of the impure. So it's almost like Purity is something derived from a victory of humanity. You know what I mean? Um, and that actually made me um, think about a distinction that's very significant as it pertains to the Abrahamic religions, especially between Islam and Christianity, although in Judaism as well. And that has to do with um, the question of original sin, right? And I think that's something we should think about because in the Islamic orientation, um, they, they foreclose the idea of original sin. They say that man is born in a state of fitra, um, a state of purity, right? So there's sort of an original purity, which is not tainted. <clears throat> in fact, um, the idea of impurity will develop as a social phenomenon, right? But it's not something that is um, embedded within the fabric of the human. So um, <clears throat> obviously, the question of violence is interesting because religion possesses a knowledge, a technology, if you like, uh, precisely around um, how to best mitigate the possible outbreak of mimetic violence. And that is why a lot of chapter one and chapter two will focus on the nature of mimetic violence itself. And the nature is often based on a logic of substitution. It's based on a logic of resemblance. And so I think all of these questions that perplexed us or perplexed me uh, from last time around why is it that the family unit possesses a um, intrinsic propensity to violence? Um, well, I think that, that uh, you'll see this when you go to the Oedipus myth um, and you'll see this uh, uh, only in conditions or primarily in conditions when you have 
And here's a concept I'll introduce that Gerard does not really introduce, but I think is extremely helpful for us. And that is the concept of stasis, S-T-A-S-I-S -S, from uh, the Greek term, which means like in Arabic, it's, it's called fitna, which is um, a unique form of social chaos, uh, which creates conditions, and this is the key point, of impersonal violence, right? So Gerard makes a beautiful point that tragedy is a story, right? About the unfurling of impersonalized violence, right? Which totally makes sense. I mean, it's like violence, which is um, outside of the will of the actors that are caught up within it, right? They're sort of um, thrown into a scene for which the violence is embedded. It's a structural feature of the society and so on, right? So I felt like uh, um, that was interesting. And acquisitive, acquisitive mimesis is um, <clears throat> interesting also because we're now talking about the notion of the object for Girard and the kind of metaphysics of the object, which he hasn't yet fully developed that, but he does, right? And especially in, um, this text, which I, again, I, I encourage you to read as kind of a companion to this book, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, you really do get a better sense of uh, Gerard's kind of metaphysics of acquisitive mimesis and why everything ultimately is about the acquiring of the object. Okay. Any, any, jump in at any time, of course. Uh, one thing I was wondering is, uh, are you looking to record these sessions at all? I am right now, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm recording. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as we, you know, I, 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 got, I got very excited reading the end of chapter two because everything came, it became fully clear to me. And I'm excited to sort of guide you along and, and see why it became a little bit more clear to me. So um, <clears throat> he has all this stuff on the notion of a transcendental system. And a transcendental system is um, a kind of highly complex you know, organization which is capable of, in a kind of, you, you almost think of like, like the, the tradition in sociology of Max Weber talks about um, the notion that institutions confer legitimacy. And I, and I really think that Gerard is very much indebted to the kind of Durkheimian and Weberian school around the notion that modernity is marked by a crisis of legitimacy and an absence of transcendence, right? So transcendence is not exactly the object of acquisitive mimesis, but it is um, that which is capable of providing a kind of um, <clears throat> set of surrogate objects, right? So the judicial system, right, would be an example for vengeance, right, and justice of, of a transcendental system, right? Um, <clears throat> And, and then, you know, obviously the, the issue with the transcendental system, including a religion is that there must be an opt-in, right? And here I'm, I'm actually reminded of a very interesting book, um, uh, uh, which is called, Did the Greeks Believe in Their Myths? I don't know if you've heard of this book before, but it actually throws into question whether the very category of belief was operative in the Greek time. Like in other words, like, did the, did the mythological pantheon of gods and all of the intricate stories of the gods heroism, right? Um, on what basis did the individual Greek citizen invest in those myths, right? And the basic argument, um, I forget the name of the author. Um, he's an incredible author, I'll, it will come to me in a moment. The basic argument is, is that the Jewish culture really invented the category of belief like qua belief, right? Um, so it's interesting here that a transcendental system is one that you must, um, that one, one that must um, have a kind of social contract consensus model with people over, right? So obviously there's a lot of, um, even, even in Foucault's notion of governmentality, I was thinking about that reading through this, right? The notion that um, kind of institutions are also capable of having non-binding adherence to them, right? Like you can kind of um, think of a transcendental system which can go for years, 
like you even think of like the conditions pre-French Revolution. Like it's often the case that if you study the, the rhetoric of the French revolutionaries, right? And like the tennis court oath, for example, uh, you know, it's many commentators and historians have noted that the statements, the utterances that were made there, <clears throat> on the one hand, they were completely spontaneous, but within the French society, it, the, the content had, had actually uh, existed for, for decades and decades prior, right? In other words, what I'm saying is that the illegitimacy factor of a, of a system, like say neoliberalism, right? Neoliberalism uh, as well, also it becomes a question of how long can it sustain itself and at what point does it uh, reveal a vulnerability to the outbreak of mimetic, of mimetic contagions, right? You, and then here you could also think about this along the end of history and Hegelian lines, right? So that um, an open question for me is, is the end of history a quelling? Obviously, I think it is, right? A quelling of mimetic contagion. And then the rebirth of history is the rebirth of a certain repressed violence that kind of comes back, yeah? And I, I, was, I was noting here that Gerard doesn't say anything about mob violence, he doesn't say anything about insurrections, he doesn't say anything about revolutions, really which is kind of an interesting omission. Maybe it will come up later, but I was sort of wondering what's Gerard's theory of revolution, right? Um, and I think once we move to the question of distinctions and the importance and the imperative of having transcendental systems that confer legitimacy also maintain hierarchies or distinctions, it is precisely here that Gerard's conservatism and dare I say his Nietzscheanism uh, uh, reveals itself. <laughs> um, okay. The other thing to note here is that it's about values, right? So, um, a transcendental system is about the maintenance of values. Um, and I, I don't know about you, but I really felt like at times, you know, he's giving us this kind of silly, vulgar postmodern reading that like, oh, you know, modern life is devoid of values or something like that. I was, He's had some trouble with some of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> he says something very striking on page 25, just as like an incredible legitimacy as a principle no longer exists. Only the introduction of some transcendental quality that will persuade men of, of the fundamental difference between sacrifice and revenge between can succeed in bypassing violence. So, you know, he kind of, he kind of has this um, chip on his shoulder around um, a certain uh, pessimism. I don't even know if pessimism is, is, is the right word, but a kind of, um, uh, I don't know, a disdain of contemporary institutions capacity to perform this legitimating principle. Um, and then he says, um, a unique generative force exists that we can only qualify as religious in a sense deeper than the theological one. It remains concealed and draws its strength from this concealment, even as its self-created shelter begins to crumble. The acknowledgement of such a force allows us to assess our modern ignorance, ignorance in regard to violence as well as religion. So uh, religion really is this, um, you know, I mean, it's, I get what he's saying. And I think we all do. But do you ever get the feeling that if you actually study religious history, that I don't know, is it true? But what about what about the Crusades, right? I mean, is it true that religious institutions were so uniquely endowed with this technology? You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Although then again, you look at things like, you know, secular state genocides and Rwanda and the Shoah, you know, so th there is that, those realities. Um, <clears throat> oh yes, did Kayam join? Oh, he's not here, okay. Um, Daniel, before you moved on, I also wanted to just um, note yeah. if that's okay. In the, the same passage, because you specifically brought up things like revolution um 
And uh, just shortly further down from the quote that you had originally quoted on, on 25, yeah. he says that, you know, he concludes that, in fact, demystification leads to constantly increasing violence, a violence perhaps less hypocritical than the violence it seeks to expose, but more energetic, more virulent, and the harbinger of something far worse, a violence that knows no bounds. And for me, when I was reading it, I immediately thought of um, this kind of that I mean, and I don't know, but I assume that that Gerard was implying in some sense toward a communist orientation or a Marxist critique in which violence and the violence of a society is named openly a violence that he says is otherwise concealed through kind of a liberal judicial system is then named as such the inner workings of which that had in some sense been hidden uh, yeah. become named and then a violence is unleashed because of that. Um, right. and, uh, yeah, I, but I wasn't sure i just wanted to throw that out you 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 were you were you were um you had the intuition that gerard was making a critique of, yes of things like bolshevik like the bolshevik yes for example. yes i want to read a, a quote from gerard that um that really supports your intuition so I, I want to affirm your intuition by sharing this quote which is not from sacred or violence in the sacred was is actually is actually from um, an interview um, on the concept of mimetic desire and in the modern, in the current period. Um, let me just listen to this. Uh, <clears throat> sure. Okay. Uh, I do not think that we should mince our words. We must refuse all the scapegoats that Freud and Freudianism have offered to us, the father, the law, etc. We must refuse the scapegoats that Marx offers, the bourgeoisie, the capitalists, etc. We must refuse the scapegoats that Nietzsche offers, slave morality, the resentment of others, and so on. All of modernism in its classic stage with Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud in the forefront merely offers us scapegoats. But if individually every one of these thinkers is delaying the full revelation, their collective effect can only prepare for its coming. They prepare the way for the omnipresent victim who has already been delayed from time immemorial by sacrificial processes that are now becoming exhausted since they appear to be more and more transparent and less and less effective. So, um, that really shows a lot of Girard's um, yeah. thinking right there about, um, and it, let's call it the latent conservatism or something like that in the sense that, is it not the case that he's saying, um, I don't know, what is he saying there? I mean, he's saying that one, we have a, a crisis of, a sacrificial crisis, okay? So there's a kind of um, incapacity to locate surrogate victims, to understand the importance of identifying surrogate victims, I'm sorry, uh, surrogate sacrificial objects, victims, etc. We have no proper outlet in our institutions for that. And then he's saying that the main uh, theorists or philosophers of, moder of modernity, Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, have missed the mark that they've they've missed the mark in this right is that how you read you understand the passage i just read yeah yeah i do i i understand it that way and i also understand it as like a profoundly um yeah it, it is a conser conservative critique in the sense that it's saying that the way that this the system i assume we could call it i don't know the liberal order or the western judicial order or whatever functions and works is that it precisely is able to obscure and hide something about it. And when you name that thing or attempt to name that thing, it, it in itself will bring only more violence. And so the best that we could hope for then is to keep that thing hidden, to keep a certain kind of, it's a contractual violence that the judicial system has some kind of monopoly of varying understanding or um, legitimate monopolization of violence so that we may function otherwise we will tear ourselves asunder there's really only the option to remain here right yes and and you know um <clears throat>
It's a tricky thesis because on the one hand, the idea of a collapse of legitimacy and the, the you know, um, con social conditions of mimetic violence um, actually explains a lot as a descriptive or, or as a heuristic, right? But yeah, but then, but then on the flip side of that, on the solution side, let's say, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, so I just want to say this for, the, for your, our understanding of, of how sacrifice works. Sacrifice uh, ends a negative cycle of vengeance, which if without it um, could tear apart institutions and families and so on and just kind of go to the end, right? You think of um, the idea of a family feud, right? As I understand Gerard, you don't end a family feud um, by, by engaging in a family feud. You, you end a family feud by finding a point of displacement outside of its conflict, outside of its flow, and you kind of latch onto that. And that latching onto that surrogate object is capable of reorientating the whole relation. And that reorientation he calls reciprocity. So it's, it introduces reciprocity, right? Um, so yeah. And and it's a bad it's a bad infinity. Vengeance is a bad infinity. I also I also picked this up the theme of displacement as an operating concept for Gerard. I've noticed multiple places in the text. Um, if you if you see here the notion of surrogate victim, he says, "quote The aim is to achieve a radically new type of violence, right? Truly decisive and self-contained, right? Because again, the violence that the surrogate victim does." is sort of is a point of self-containment or it's sort of displaced from the thing of, of the of the cycle itself <clears throat> the other thing to note here is the dialectic i guess you could call it a dialectic between purity and impurity um and i think i mentioned this at the outset um, um that this is of paramount importance and i think that you all are familiar with like this logic within religious traditions generally. That's where you see it the most. And I think that Gerard is very sympathetic to religions precisely because they formulate their metaphysics off of purity and impurity, right? And I was thinking about this, I don't know about you, but have you noticed in our contemporary political discourse such a disdain for the very notion of that, that there would be a dialect between purity and impurity, right? Um, and it is the fact, I, I would say, that in the liberal order we live in today, um, it is much more preferable to be on the side of impure, right? Like the most outlaw position to be is the purist, right? Um, you are either too conservative, you're too tied to, tied to tradition, um, or you are too egalitarian, right? You are too open to the breaking of tradition. Right, you are too open to, and so it's here where okay. Or you're a liberal. You're just you're 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 too um, uh, puritan, I guess. Well, that, I, I actually don't think that that's what liberalism is. I actually think liberalism, right? You can have a purity to liberalism, but it's not a true purity to something. Yeah? It's a purity to a process. It's a purity to an idea of a plural, uh, you know, like, let's say, maintaining the, the pluralism of the public sphere or maintaining uh, a, a proper tolerance for divergent views. So you can have a purity to the to, to, to that process, but it's not really a, a, a purity to a principle or a purity to an idea. You see, you see my point. I think that liberalism actually is not really founded on ideas. It's, it, 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 it forges a kind of compromise position to pure ideas. This is why, by the way, um, one of the best ways to understand the dialectic between socialism and liberalism uh, is a dialectic between realism versus nominalism, because liberalism is actually a nominalistic orientation to things like truth, justice. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. You see why, because uh, if a liberal affirmed the absolute state of equality, um, that would foreclose 
the very possibility of, a, uh, uh, of, of what liberalism stands for, which is a system which would allow multiple ideas of what equality is, right? So the same with religious freedom, right? Um, so. But ultimately nobody, like Duncan wrote, the purity of moderation, it's, it's laughable. It's, it's, right, it's ticklish. Um, nobody can be pure, uh, pu purely adhere to the right. absolute, the Hegel's absolute. Uh, I, uh, that, <laughs> that's very funny you say that. Um, this is what Schelling accused all philosophers of. He said, uh, even Spinoza was faking it. Right? There's kind of this, and even Gerard is kind of like this too. There's a certain type of person who views, um, I'm not sure why, but I don't know if you've noticed it, like nothing can be truly authentic. You know that kind of attitude, you know what I mean? Or nothing can be fully, um, the, 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 every, every investment it contains a kind of contradictory element. So there's never a full kind of thing. And I, you, Hegel. Uh, no, I don't think that we should read Hegel like that, actually. I don't think that Hegel, um, I mean, I think in general, Hegel's um, of absolute, idea of absolute self-knowledge um, is something that's fun. I mean, well, first and foremost, most important, aside from how we would phenomenologically describe that for the individual, right, in relation to it. We could maybe do that. But the more important question is, um, for whom is the absolute accessible? Is the absolute accessible to all? And that then becomes another way in which you can differentiate kind of liberalism proper, for which liberalism, it's dark underbelly, will make the claim that no, there are certain access points to absolute truths, which are not like so-called eligible, everyone is eligible to. Um, I think that liberalism has a kind of um, disavowal relationship to the, what I just said, in my opinion. Uh, anyways, I don't wanna get too far off on my, cause I get all like this heavy jouissance with liberal stuff. I just go crazy and this is not good. Um, okay, so we understand this surrogate victim then he talks about on 37 to 38 sexuality and the whole bloodletting menstrual cycle phenomenon in religious traditions and in ethnological anthropo anthropological research. Um, and I actually felt like, and I know there's a whole chapter coming on psychoanalysis, so we can kind of wait for that. Um, I don't know. I, this was an interesting section on, on, on a few counts. Uh, his main point here is that, um, first of all, blood, human blood possesses um, the point of the real, right? Like for him, it's kind of, he always makes this insistent point, like we were saying with the uber structuralism apropos sacrifice. Um, he's like, look, if you look at purity rituals with bloodletting and menstrual cycles um, across all of these examples, you'll see my point about the universality, right? Of, um, of the way in which the sexual, sexual relation is also fundamentally tied up into a sacrificial relation. Um, and you guys know all of this stuff when the menstrual period comes for the woman, um, it is very much uh, a common across all cultures. I, I, I believe he's saying that um, you know, women are, are of the impure, right? Um, yeah, looking up in the Bible, the, the Leviticus 17, that um, the, soul, the soul is in the blood. Mm. That's yeah. the, from the chapter on sacrifices. Oh, interesting. Wow. You just pulled that up right now? Yeah. <laughs> interesting. <clears throat> I, th I, th I thought that this was a nice point. The secret of this mechanism is unknown to the participants in the rites. Religion tries to account for its own operation metaphorically. And you'll see this is the second time he's mentioned that. Part of the ingenuity of religion um, is that, you know, like 
they've come up with all of these elaborate ways to enact um, small metaphoristic enactments of original sacrifices, right? Um, this is like in the Islamic tradition, what is um, uh, reenacted um, in, in a number of different festivals and holidays where um, the sacrificial lamb, for example, right? Um, I've ever seen those images of like thousands of slaughtered lambs by people just like using knives across the neck, you know? Um, <clears throat> so all of that's fine. Again, let's kind of, let's just bracket sexuality and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that later. I think he'll, he'll have a lot to say on that. Um, so that's the end of chapter one. We went from page 18 to ending chapter one. And he kind of ends, I think, my, my reading of the blood, bloodletting and menstrual cycles and all of that is to hit home the centrality of sacrifice. If even in the sexual relation, it still adheres to this logic, right? So that's, and chapter one was really good. I mean, it was a very, um, he's a great writer, right? There's no doubt that he's putting together a, a kind of magisterial presentation on the topic, right? Um, now, chapter two is largely interested in the kind of the general theme of um, how uh, or what happens when surrogate victim logics uh, and there is a there is a breakdown, basically right? a social breakdown um, in this displaced source to handle and mitigate social violence. So he says, sacrifice ends vengeance, but I want to read this. But if the gap between the victim and the community is allowed to grow too wide, all similarity will be destroyed. The victim will no longer be capable of attracting the violent impulses to itself. The sacrifice will cease to serve as a good conductor in the sense that metal is a good conductor of electricity. On the other hand, if there is too much continuity, the violence will overflow its channels. Impure violence will mingle with the sacred violence of the rights, turning the latter into a scandalous accomplice. So uh, if we go to page, I don't know if you guys have your books with you. Uh, go to page 41, there is some good stuff there. Um, one second here. Did anybody else stay up like way too late last night? Did yeah. you? Yeah. Well, you guys are on the West Coast and not as bad as us out here. Right. Oh man, it was rough. Yeah. I, I saw into the abyss. <laughs> was, uh... Yeah, but you know, I had a few IPAs that kind of helped the, uh, the pain. Uh... Okay. Um... So here on page 41, what he's really talking about um is the way in which resemblance plays a role within sacrifice now this is counterintuitive to all of us i i think it's very weird and he's talking here about physical resemblance and he's talking about how surrogate uh victims um must like not have a kind of physical resemblance. And then he also mentions this issue of twins to um, underline his point about the importance of um, cultures, um, basically resemblance, the mimetic resemblance of appearance, the mirror and so on. I think narcissists and all of that creates a profound issue of the perpetuation of violence. That was actually something I didn't really know. Did you guys know that? I don't know, Levi, you do more anthropology than, than all of us, so. It's very it, it, yeah, it is something that definitely, I mean, he, he harps a lot on the idea of uh, killing one of the twins, which is definitely a thing, but as he kind of notes a little bit later, it's also, I think, om almost just as extensive that people would see twins as a sign of good luck. So it, his anthropological examples that he picks and I know that he's been critiqued by anthropologists for this. It's, it is sometimes I think a little bit of cherry picking. Yeah, yeah, that's that's helpful. Yeah. 
uh, he says, quote, the difference between sacrificial and non-sacrificial violence is anything but exact. It's even arbitrary. At times, the difference threatens to disappear entirely. There is no such thing as truly pure violence. Nevertheless, sacrificial violence can, in the proper circumstances, serve as an agent of purification. That is why those who perform the rites are obliged to purify themselves at the conclusion of the sacrifice. Um, and then he gets into Euripides's uh, Heracles, the play. Um, and hey, so, sorry, Daniel, could I could I pause and uh, yeah. ask about that quote? Um, so something that has been that has really been bugging me a little bit during this part is that exactly that Gerard makes the claim that sacrifice is ultimately toward the same of purity, right? And at the end of the sacrificial rite, the, those will become pure in some sense. But then in that exact quote that you just read, he says, you know, there's no such thing as a truly pure violence. Nevertheless, sacrificial violence can, in the proper, proper circumstances, serve as an agent of purification. That is why those who perform the rites are obliged to purify themselves at the conclusion of the sacrifice. Right. So there's a kind of a slippage here in which the purity is not in the sacrifice itself, but those are actually obliged to purify themselves after the sacrifice has been conducted. Yes. And if, yes. And, and so then I felt like that's a slippage of terms because he's actually acknowledging implicitly that sacrifice itself is not always a purifying thing in some ways. So absolutely. Yeah. No, that's absolutely tr true. And I think that's actually maybe not a contradiction. I think actually, if we read him closely, I think what he's saying is that the sacrificial operation is a, what I'm calling a displacement from constitutive violence, right? Mm -hmm. And it allows for a reprieve. It allows for a relaxation. It allows for a momentary quelling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or longer, right? But and it has to be repeated, which is why it's enacted in rights. Mm -hmm. um, but in and of itself, it's it has effects, right? But it itself, it's almost like a performance or something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But then, yeah, you know, what is it satiating, right? What is it? Yeah. What is it satisfying for the participants? Um, because if 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 that's the case, it's a it's an extraordinarily uh, sadistic claim. I mean, when Freud introduces um, the death drive and beyond the pleasure principle, I remember this very clearly. He says we can also call this drive the sadistic drive. Straight up, a lot of people don't know that. So I think there's a kind of interesting paper to be written about sadism in Gerard. <laughs> It's very Game of Thrones, you know, Gerard is kind of like, he probably would have liked Game of Thrones, you know, because Game of Thrones presents a world of this kind of eternal struggle, right? Interminable, right? It's a very non-utopian show, right? Um, so. I have something to throw out there too. It seems like, you know, um, uh, this displacement thing I think is really tricky because um, it's almost um, outside of our control in some ways. Um, and even if it was in our control, um, like for example, I teach some classes on anger and they used to have this idea sort of like if you scream into a pillow, like that will help sort of offset your anger. Like you won't get angry at other people. Is that not true? <laughs> it, it actually isn't true. It actually reinforces your capability of getting wow. angry and it's not good. I'm going to tell my wife that next time. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Why does it do that out of curiosity? Why is it not? I, I really don't know. I, I just sort of had the conclusion. I don't really have the data behind it, but um, I wonder if it's just sort of like experimentation and like it's just reinforcing like the, the, the drive to sort of uh, repeat. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not healing in some ways. Again, it's, I think we misunderstand violence in some ways. I think, and this is sort of my concern, more of a bigger concern with Gerard, I guess, is I sort of fall into sort of the individual yeah. sort of um, uh, understanding of more of these things. And I think it's not so sort of explainable. It's sort of um, inherent, I guess, in our actions that we're violent, I suppose, um, right. which, which is kind of what he's also saying. So yeah. Anyway, I don't, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but 
No, no, it's it's helpful. Um, yeah. I, I kind of like this idea that social um, orders can sort of fail. Yeah, they they fail in legitimacy, but what causes in part the failure of them being capable of garnering legitimacy, right? Is that, that they sort of haven't come up with good substitution performances or scenarios for the people in some sense, right? There's a certain, um, like I think we were talking last time about, it would be interesting, I wonder why the, um, the Roman culture of the Colosseum and the kind of mob enjoyment. I wonder what Gerard thinks of that because it seems like it would very much, you know, fit his, his wider kind of claim here, right? In other words, there was a sort of technology of the transcendental of the Roman Empire, which knew very well uh, how to derive these substitution, um, maybe even better than the Greeks, right? Um, I'm not familiar with Euripides' Heracles play. I don't know if anyone else is, you can speak about it, but what he wants to show here and also with Oedipus is a common motif in, in, in um, Greek plays and tragedies uh, which is basically when substitution goes wrong, you have the unfurling of mimetic violence, which takes on, this is the key point, where does it, where does it go? I like this point. It goes to the family, right? The family becomes infected with a conflict which is based on resemblance, which is how he describes Oedipus's conflict with the, 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 the parents. So that's a really fascinating um, point, which is almost that it gives us an account, which I was looking for before, right? Mm. As to, as to uh, why is the violence so const or housed within the family, right? And I think the answer is, is that presupposes conditions whereby mimetic violence is rampant. And so that then introduces us to this whole question of, stabilization of social order versus unstable, right? Which we're gonna to get to in a moment. Um, but anyway, so Heracles says, uh, it shows how sacrifice goes wrong. Instead of drawing off the violence and allowing it to ebb away, the rights brought a veritable flood of violence down on the victim. The sacrificial rights were no longer able to accomplish their task. They swelled the surging of the tide of impure violence instead of channeling it. Again, the dialectic of impure, impure. And again, I think Gerard actually has something to teach us there, going back to our point about purity. Um, like as putting aside the whole question of liberalism, just as an aside, wh why in the fuck are we so um, uneasy, right? Why is our culture so uneasy about um, confessing like that purity and purity are real and that they matter? That's an interesting question. The mechanism of substitutions had gone astray and those whom the sacrifice was designed to protect became its victims, right? So when the substitution mechanism fails, and you could even think about this maybe in the logic of um, imperialism, right? Like I'm thinking here of um, the Iraq war. I mean, is it not the case that, okay, what happens at the collapse of Soviet Union? It becomes a kind of internal schizophrenia of the war machine looking for a new surrogate you see what i'm see what i mean and so it sort of goes and finds the from the red menace to the green menace right <laughs> from 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 communism to islam right um here again logic of displacement on page 45 um <clears throat> um neighbors who have previously discharged their mutual aggressions on a third party uh, joining together in the sacrifice of an outside victim now turn to sacrificing one another. So this notion is interesting, which is um, when the displacement doesn't work, when the outside other no longer satiates or no longer performs properly, it's an internal implosion. And this again is stasis. Like the, the French philosopher Bernard Stegler writes a lot about contemporary stasis, right? Which is, what is that? It is kind of like this Spinozistic notion that uh, 
we lack the ground of assigning the causality of social fragmentation and that it's so far reaching social fragmentation is that we cannot reduce it to inequality or racism or gender exclusion it's a fundamentally interwoven fragmentation right this is this is the logic of stasis and aristotle in the politics would write a shitload about the importance of preventing stasis right so the aristotelian orientation um maintains a steadfast commitment at all costs to prevent the outbreak of stasis right which has to do with the management of the categories of society and their stabilization right so it's very much on a logic of stable unstable and so on right um i have a couple of examples here that i think would fit good as well as yeah. far as this process and they're um through foucault he talks about um the spectacle and sort of the failure historically of like hanging people on the town square yeah because people would uprise and become violent in fact yeah and people would lose control then of their population through that so that went away sort of the spectacle which i think is now sort of coming yeah, this is uh, from discipline and punish where he says I think so. yeah he says, yeah he says before french revolution the um punishment of the subject for their crime its efficacy was derived from the public instantiation of their humiliation right there you go but then after in about the early 1800s 1830s onward when you have the kind of scientific apparatus take on the penal mm -hmm. system it's around the interior humiliation of the individual which uh, yes. is is Good. infinitely worse right it's like finally yeah. the, the christian turn enters into the dynamic right so right and, and we're so talking about the social thing. other is no longer there right yeah and it's the same thing gerard is kind of saying where it falls from society to the family to the individual and sort of to inside of the individual well it's interesting also when you look at the chauvin police officer who killed george floyd mm -hmm. i heard somebody say on a podcast well you know the riots probably wouldn't have happened if we would have been able to execute chauvin in public sure uh, the spectacle again it's the social apparatus there that we <laughs> are drooling for um and the I other i believe that though that's that's a wild theme yeah the the other thing i wanted to point out it's also what foucault talks about with like the rise of nazism is like uh, initially sort of um the european countries had sort of an other that they could uh blame for problems but yeah. then that other went away and so then it became it sort of dropped down to the right. level of families right in sort of like well i hate your family and i hate your race and right in nazism so there may be something to this in displacement and having an inappropriate sort of uh so i'm starting to buy into this a little bit more maybe maybe there yeah. is yeah so let's look at this a little bit more so stasis is e equals or is defined by gerard and this is super important this is like my favorite part of gerard right here but i have a, a schadenfreude favoritism here because i don't like it but he, <laughs> he defines stasis as a breakdown of distinctions which is super super important right what does that mean that means a breakdown of hierarchy mm. right that means that hierarchy must be maintained <laughs> mm. uh gerard you are not a comrade <laughs> uh, the sacrificial crisis that is the disappearance of the sacrificial rights coincides with the disappearance of the difference between impure violence and purified violence so that distinction goes away when this difference has been effaced purification is no longer possible and impure contagious reciprocal violence spreads throughout the community so there you go so uh, a well-ordered society maintains the dialectic between pure and impure violence you can handle it right um and i put this notion of fitra and sin i think this is interesting for us to think about which is um in a you know kind of post-christian world right um it would be interesting to ask sort of where sin goes because i'm really understanding sin as on the side of this dialectic of purity and impurity right um so might might we suggest that there is a marketized logic 
right? That sort of we can map this dialectic of purity and purity on, I don't know, like Marcuse's performance principle, right? On the kind of entrepreneurialization of the self, right? Um, I don't know, in a certain hyper bourgeois sense, why not? You could, right? You could, you could make this claim that there is a kind of purity and purity qua success, right? And I think this is a fair point, right? The Americanization of social life imposes this, this, this necessity of being successful, right? Um, so we don't call it purity and impurity, but I think the logic is kind of there, right? Um, this is something to think about. And then he says, um, <clears throat> yeah, so what happens here is that when you are a subject or a character involved in mimetic violence, involved in a kind of contagious violence where, where distinctions have faltered, where the, the transcendental system doesn't have its efficacy and so on, you become impartial because you're relating to this impersonal violence and it kind of marks you um, as sort of losing your own singular, you lose your own singularity, right? Um, and, and that's when resemblance comes about. And so that's an open question for me. Why does resemblance emerge there? Um, I mean, we should go back to the text and look a little more closely on page 48. I can stop my share there and bring it up. This is sort of an open thing for me is, is a resemblance. <clears throat> but this is pretty interesting, right? You, you guys uh, find this stuff kind of interesting, yeah? Let's see where we at here. Okay. Um, so, you know, the idea is, is now we're getting to Oedipus, which I think is a play which is going to be very much more familiar to all of us. But in um, Euripides' example, um, it was a father-son dynamic. And it's important to note, by the way, that um, he presents a different um, function of the father within a social order than does Freud in Totem and Taboo towards the end of chapter two, if you're interested. And he, he relies on this guy, Malinowski and Levi, Who's Malinowski, by the way? He's like a he's like a, a frequently cited. He is the father of father of modern anthropology. He was the first anthropologist to uh, quote unquote leave the armchair or the veranda and actually live full time uh -huh. with the societies he was working with. Uh huh. So, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um. So yeah, look at this. All the bloody events that serve as background to the plays, the plagues and pestilences, civil and foreign wars, undoubtedly reflect, reflect the contemporary scene. But the images are unclear as if you throw a glass darkly. Each time, for example, a play of Euripides deals with the collapse of a royal house, we are convinced that the poet is suggesting that the scene before our eyes is only the tip of the iceberg, that the real issue is the fate of the entire community. Um, so what is he saying here? He's saying that, um, uh, here we go, here we go. If the art of tragedy is to be defining a single phrase, we might do worse than call attention to one of its most characteristic traits, the opposition of symmetrical elements. There is no aspect of the plot, former language of a tragedy in which this symmetrical pattern does not occur. Um, I see what this means. Yeah, the symmetry of the tragic dialogue is perfectly mirrored by the stichomythia, I think I pronounced that correctly, in which the two protagonists address one another in alternating lines. In tragic dialogue, hot words are substituted for cold steel, I see. So he kind of, I think what he's saying here is that there's a highly geometrical symmetry that is at play within tragic like tragedy lends itself to this structured symmetry which is ultimately going to be related to mimesis in a moment um and this is an important point tragedy is about the balancing of the scale not of justice but of violence no sooner is something added to one side of the scale than its equivalent is contributed to the other so you see the point, each tragic scenario 
plays itself out upon the setting wherein stasis has already occurred. Um, so that's that's all very, I think, correct. And then and then and then he he points out about how Holderlin um, also found this logic of the impartial character. I mean, it reminds me also of Holderlin's reading of Oedipus, which was um, because Oedipus was caught up within events for Holderlin, which usurped like his conscious will, basically, um, he became a kind of impersonal actor on a, on a scene uh, which was already set, so to speak. And um, Deleuze makes this beautiful point. I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but he says that Kant um, was so influenced by Holderlin's reading of the Oedipus drama that the notion of the transcendental um, was in part derived from Holderlin's idea of a subjectivity, which is purely subtracted like that, uh, like especially at the most dramatic point of the play where you get to Oedipus at Colonus, uh, where he is blinded at still persisting on. Like he has somehow um, uh, won the game, which was already stacked against him, right? He sort of persevered at that point in the play. And um, then of course this, he should not, he should not exist, yet he still does, he still persists, right? Because all of the identificatory logics that linked him to his family, to social role, to everything, all of his stabilizations were completely upended, were completely mimetically destroyed, and yet he comes out the other side and he's still persisting, right? So for the psychoanalyst, this is a question of, okay, well, what's the composition of his desire at that point? But I think for Girard, he's not interested in so much in the desire of Oedipus at that point. He's interested in um, sort of, why is it that the tragic scenario involves this um, implosion of resemblance-based struggles? Um, okay, so it says, yeah, here you go. The conflict stretches on interminably because between the two adversaries, there is no difference whatsoever. Uh, so it's a loss of singularity again. And I think this is what this notion of impartiality refers to, right? You, if, okay, I'll put it this way. If a tragic scenario is one in which the actors are operating outside of um, distinctions. That's interesting. That, that, that kind of explains it. Why, why that would be, um, why that would perpetuate violence. I think I can see the linkage there. I don't know about you. Um, the self-proclaimed advocate of impartiality does not want to commit himself to either course of action. If pushed toward one camp, he seeks refuge in the other. Men always find it distasteful to admit that the reasons on both sides of a dispute are equally valid, which is to say that violence operates without reason. Um, interesting. Okay. Now he's getting more into Oedipus. Um, at the very moment when they appear to be abandoning impartiality, the tragedians do their utmost to deprive the audience of any means of taking sides. So I think this is clear. This is what, what did Hegel say about tragedy? It's when um, um, the overlapping of two rights that cannot derive a wrong or something like that, right? Where it makes sense, right? It's, it's this notion that um, justice cannot be established within a tragic cosmos, right? Because you're fighting over two systems which are fundamentally non-contradictory. Non so in that sense, it's kind of like a, like a, uh, defective dialectic, right? I think that makes sense. It's the uh, same thing actually Nietzsche says um, about justice and about um, violence. Um, and he basically says violence and justice are brothers. Um, and well, and so, well, let me say that again. 
um, it's, it's knowledge and justice that are brothers. So you kind of like, if you have one, you have them both, which I think is interesting because it plays into this sort of mimetic idea of Gerard's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically like if you have knowledge, you're not gonna be able to have justice because already sort of like you're saying, there's sort of this, well, you were saying earlier about the liberals sort of having their own sort of um, mechanism there to see different truths you were talking about. Right. Like, as long as that's there, you can't have sort of justice that precludes it because mm -hmm. you, have, you have this other attractive sort of thing. Yeah. Anyway, um, no, you're right. You're right. I think justice is at play, but he says that it's primarily about violence. Um, that tragedy primarily enacts or confronts violence. Um, I, whereas I think justice um, is off is less prevalent. Although that's not exactly true in um, Athena's case, where she's like a total figure of of justice. So I I don't know, but. Um, yeah, the more a tragic conflict is prolonged, the more likely it is to culminate in a violent mimesis. The resemblance between the combatants grows ever stronger until each presents a mirror image of the other. And now here he's getting into this really silly business. And this is probably why a lot of like neo-libs love Gerard around like neuroscience and all of this BS. Because um, he's now wanting to make this claim that I can prove this claim on resemblance through scientific means. Hmm. Um, I don't know exactly what that means by what kind of science. Um, um, so I don't know if anybody has a sense of what kind of science he's referring to, social science or something from behavioral evolutionary psychology, who knows? I, I, I think there are four times identified in the text where he evokes science to <laughs> Yeah, yeah, kind of substantiate his claim, but then doesn't cite it at all. So it is interesting. Yeah, it, it's it's also interesting how phallic of a of a sign science is for Gerard because, like, when you see him talk about psychoanalysis, what's one of the main things he wants to say? It's not scientific, right? He wants to just say that over and over and over. So, Gerard's interested in distinctions and he's interested in legitimacy, and so invoking science, you can see is a kind of uh, a weapon, right? Uh, so here, but here, but nonetheless, he has a nice reading of Oedipus. So let's look at it. Sophocles frequently puts in Oedipus's mouth words that emphasize his resemblance to his father, resemblance in desires, suspicions, and course of action. If the hero throws himself impetuously into the investigation that causes his downfall, it's because he's reacting just as Laius did in seeking out the potential assassin. Uh, okay, so. In other words, instead of the Freudian theory of law of desire determining an unconscious orientation to the um, uh, to the to the spellbound uh, destiny, right, or 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 to however you want to theorize the Oedipus complex as it pertains to Freud, there's several ways you could do it. Uh, I think the logic here is a lot different because it's again it's presupposed on a tragic cosmos wherein mimetic violence is rampant, right? And in those conditions, right? I mean, like if, if Oedipus, Oedipus could not be set in like the 1990s in Los Angeles, like, you know, classic Fukuyama end of history, right? It couldn't, right? It probably wouldn't work there, which is actually interesting. Have you seen True Detective season two where they play on a kind of motif of Oedipus where like actually the daughter is named Antigone and then the father, have you seen that? No. You know, the really first- underrated. Yeah, it's very interesting. But what was interesting about it was the society was not stasis. Like in other words, the, there was a kind of noir um, darkness. There was a kind of dread right? But there was not a perpetual violence, right? There was not a kind of unsustainable, unstable disharm disharmony. So it's a very different kind of aesthetic presentation of stasis. I mean, it was maybe the authors kind of missed that uh, part of tragedy. 
Well, wait, because uh, one example that comes to mind is what I was thinking of earlier, even too, of talking about like, um, like sacrifice, rituals of sacrifice in the liberal era or whatever. Um, is couldn't you read uh, that violence occurring like in the sort of like eyes wide shut, like Epstein parties that go on in that series, in, the, in that season particularly? like the, that kind of ground the whole like ruling elite structure of los yeah. angeles with like imported eastern european women things like that yeah like the the um the the pedophile ring like the logic of the pedophile ring qua surrogate object right on the one hand yeah. or or you could read the pedophile uh structure um as as an oath right which is a secrecy oath for you know, conferring a consistency of the legitimating class, also the ruling class, um, engaging illicit activity in order to derive a negative knowledge of one another that they can use against one another as a weapon if they need to, right? So if you wa if you waver away from our agenda, we have the videos of you with a 15 year old, right? I think something like that might also function there um possibly I, I mean i know it is true if you listen to the interview what was it the um the uh do you guys listen to the joe rogan podcast i know it's a very polarizing thing but he actually interviewed somebody where he um made that nice made that point which i thought was a decent point because I, I do think at this point like something like epstein um should be actually ex like taken out of the the realm of conspiracy do you know what i mean like we should kind of analyze it differently I don't know if you agree. Um, oh, would you necessarily have to read that as like mutually exclusive though with a, um, a ritual system of sacrifice as well? Uh, is, is there a public private dynamic that maybe creates an antagonism between those two readings or? I don't know, like it's, it's interesting right now because the legitimacy of the neoliberal order is so frayed clearly that it seems to me that it's probably unlikely that these sorts of rituals are still going on or you know what I mean like they're they're probably they have a heyday or they have a kind of valence of success in in corresponding logic to the success of the legitimation of the own order you know what I mean mm -hmm. um I just I just I think that the 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 the, the um uh the, the the legitimacy is so odious right now I mean as evidenced by last night right um okay so all of this makes sense to us here's a nice passage i want to focus on on page 51 he says the sacrificial crisis that is the disappearance of the sacrificial rights so that's key right which kind of is ironic because we just mentioned that <laughs> so when the when, when the rights go away um the rights um that coincides with the disappearance of the difference between impure so, okay, so he's made that point. Now we really get that. When this difference has been effaced, purification is no longer possible and impure, contagious, reciprocal violence spreads. So, you know, I don't know about you, but this is really showing how important purity and impurity is to the, his whole framework. You see how important it is? It's like it's like the, the, the thread, right? Um, so now I'm really wondering if he's gonna give us, you know, more on on just on on the, the the kind of genealogical account of purity and impurity you know it might be it might be helpful um <clears throat> okay what else do we have here um yeah um yes the sacrificial crisis can be defined also as a crisis of distinctions that is a crisis affecting the cultural order. This cultural order is nothing more than a regulated system of distinctions in which the differences amongst individuals are used to establish their identity and their mutual relationships. So I'm just going to go back to my little slide here and show you one other thing I wrote on this. Because um, I really don't like this idea. Um, so um you know <laughs> i think we should talk about this because i'm just curious what you think i mean um his argument would sound a lot different if he if he swapped the word hierarchy for distinction but i think this you could do that right 
and then and then it becomes a question of okay well um how does one uh inculcate in my view this is like a question for me right how does the introduction of egalitarian hierarchies work right so this is some interesting work um from the end notes collective a communist collective it's actually analyzed how the ussr introduced um labor rights at certain points within factories i think in like the 1950s and 60s once they really got off the ground right and um um how in in a certain sense it's a very interesting um tra tragic situation if you look at the latest end notes uh i think it's volume 13 or 12 or something like that um you know, it was a long story short from my memory of reading this passage was that, you know, in essence, it didn't work like the um, there was something about the um, um, difficulty of concocting egalitarian hierarchies uh, within institutions. Um, it, 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 in other words, it didn't work because it led to issues of envy which became kind of unmanageable on the factory floor right and i felt like for for nietzsche um and he mentions nietzsche at the end of this chapter the issue of resentment is an issue that emerges at a certain point primarily with socrates but then um evolves and and takes uh, different forms in other social situations but it is an issue of the introduction of the egalitarian impulse, right? Of the kind of um, refusal of hierarchy, of the ascertainment or the assertion or the affirmation of a fundamental equality, right? Um, and Nietzsche names the chaos that comes with that imposition or that introduction, nihilism, right? So nihilism is the effect of the plebeian class demanding a new set of needs or a new uh set of inclusions right um which is why for nietzsche the the entirety of his world that he was existed in was was um you could say one of stasis in what sense it was a stasis precisely of the underclass so there's a certain logic that in order for the social harmony to persist what is it honey sorry my dog's barking uh in order for the social harmony to persist you also need a class which is eligible to be excluded from formal formal equality i mean you could say okay yeah you need the existence of sl slave structure which i think is a fair point um because i think for nietzsche there's a full through line between slave societies feudal societies and capitalist societies like structurally each one contains a a vulgar underclass which must um sacrifice yeah uh, a certain expenditure to allow for the surplus leisure of the aesthetic class or the producing class the artistic class and so on right um so yeah so like i feel like Gerard's not far off from that, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of latent Nietzscheanism in Gerard. Um, and what do you guys think? Is that too uh, too strong? Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I think too. On the other hand, I think Nietzsche was talking about you know how like the resentment um, is all weakness and bad, but then Gerard uses the foundation of that, which is religion. To build his case that there's a benefit to that so yeah yeah well yeah yeah that that's true i think that's a, that's a that's a good point and and religious systems are systems that are also involve egalitarian attempts at the introduction of egalitarian um order right social hierarchies based on egalitarian principles you you do find that so that is true right um and you know it also raises the point which is why must left-wing emancipatory um thinking why do we have so much antagonism to religion 
when we think about religion in this Girardian way, you kind of get less, you know, you, you sort of um, see a certain value, an intrinsic value. Um, I think it's also useful to, to, to remember that um, systems of social order are systems of, you know, transcendental legitimacy makers, right? I mean, it's interesting also, yeah, it's like, I don't know, most of you are old enough to like remember a time in this country where everything was fine. Do you know what I mean? Like it, that, not everything was fine per se, but like the, the even, even like the category of the future was still a viable horizon, you know, like um, we didn't need, um, like there, there was just not a, a, a sense of urgency for, or even a sense of panic. I think that panic is another motif. I don't know if you guys have read um, an incredible effort by a, uh, two philosophers in the early 1990s, right as the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, uh, the names are Jean-Luc Nancy and Philippe Lacoulabar. And they gathered all of these really prominent thinkers to a, a kind of think tank, right? And they gave a series of presentations. This is where Derrida gave his very famous presentation called The Ends of Man, which you can read as a text. Um, it's kind of this invocation. One of the invocations, one of the themes was uh, how does panic arise at the collapse of this kind of end of history moment? And I feel like crisis and panic have been such sunk structural features of our social social order. You know what I mean? Where, whereas now it's like a kind of mimesis of panic. You know what I mean? It's like a kind of um, a, 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 a mimesis of outrage, this outrage machine that just constantly goes. And it, it's so exhausting, you know? It's, um, anyways. Um, I, I also could say something about distinctions because I was also deeply troubled by this, but in a kind of a different way. I mean, I, I brought up Bataille last time. I don't mean to keep bringing nope. him up, but sure. I, I really am like reading this book. I feel like I'm reading the literal inverse of Bataille. I don't know if anyone knows how much Girard was trying to be in direct dialogue with Bataille or not, but for me, uh, Bataille, sacrifice was the thing that bonded sacrificers like specifically through the sacrificial act you you lost distinctions for a moment rather than gaining them yeah so i was really interested that gerard is trying to think about how sacrifice instantiates distinctions but then i also realized that for bataille when he invokes sacrifice he's all often talking about how a community sacrifices another to create yep. their own communal identity Whereas yes. for Girard, what is interesting, he's always talking about sacrifice within the community itself. There isn't, in some sense, an external other in the same way, which me, for me, I thought that was really interesting because it, it almost betrays or illuminates something of Girard in which we are at an end of history moment already, in which, for me, when I think about liberalism or neoliberalism conceptualizing the whole world as one large community now, in which you all might come together and present your differences on an equal playing field or something. Yeah. Uh, it's really revealing of that kind of liberal end of history logic then. Mm -hmm. Girard is kind of through this notion of sacrifice portraying modern society as one large community and the dangers that it might break up. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, like I, I love everything you just mentioned. And you know, Victor Turner, who wrote The Ritual Process, who's referenced in the book quite a lot, he has this nice distinction that is kind of more in line with the Bataille line that you just mentioned, where he says, look, um, there's a logic of, um, there's two dominant logics whereby social orders um, compose themselves, what he calls structure, versus communitas from the Latin of community. And communitas is a dialectical opposition to what he calls structure. And structure is a society built on a transcendental 
legitimacy with distinctions and well-ordered Aristotelian balance. So he theorizes um, a kind of reperiodization of history. You can take any social order and reperiodize it based on moments of rupture with structure. And those moments of rupture um, propel structure in a certain way, right? Like they, it's kind of like the logic of um, Luke Boltanski's The New Spirit of Capitalism, where he says something incredible about May 68, which was, what if we viewed capitalism as uh, in conversation, not conversation, but in a dialectical tension with emancipatory uh, impulses and egalitarian impulses of the, of the society, so that when you have a liberatory upsurge like 68, he studied how over the few decades after 68 up to the 90s, um, business corporate literature adopted many of the same slogans as the protesters. Um, flexible workplaces, you know, horizontalism, um, less patriarchal uh, social orders, you know, um, freedom of expression, right? So uh, it's kind of, I think for leftists, maybe a little horrifying or unnerving or shameful that we have this close, because um, you know, like I think there's a certain trad tradition of, of left leftism, especially with Lenin and Mao, which really doesn't want to see revolutionary activity as caught up within a dialectic with, capital with capitalist society, right? They wanna, instantiate a kind of subtraction from that. But then there's another way to look at the logic of history and you see this in like Hart and Negri as well and Boltanski as well, where they're basically saying, yeah, look like um, the logic of history is communitas or is revolutionary upsurge, but it dialectically gets integrated in ways which are exceedingly complex. So that's a framework of thinking about social change, which I don't know, we can take it or leave it, right? But it's something. Right. Um, and um, it's very much related to your point. Um, and that, that, that's a really, we should do a search on like JSTOR to see who has written about Gerard and Bataille. There's got to be some work done on this. Right. I mean, I would only assume. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that a lot. And it, it's also just making me think when Gerard talks about distinctions. Again, I, I do think that it's important to note that he's always is trying to still, it seems to me at least, emphasize something about distinctions that are hidden, distinctions that are in some ways veiled yeah. from society. Like it's not just that it's distinctions in and of themselves in a hierarchy that we can all understand, but in fact true, that true. the trick of liberalism or neoliberalism is that it somehow offers an equal playing field while yeah. maintaining distinctions secretly or behind the yeah. curtain. Yeah. yeah. No, very nice point. I mean, that's why um, I was having a conversation with Jody Dean once and she said, you know, neoliberalism presents a massive uh, challenge to a statement that Marx once made, which is that a communist society would be one in which um, I can be a critic in the morning, I can go hunting in the afternoon and I can, you know, plow my fields in the, the evening if I wish, or I can reverse those the next day. And she's like, you know, a kind of well-lubed neoliberal entrepreneurial society is trying to offer you that precise thing, right? Like this is actually, that is the offer on the table, right? <laughs> Be your own boss. You can yes. in a millionaire at night. Well, let's not get too... Uh, uh, Mind. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's an irony, right? It's like, it's like a, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a problem though, because the neoliberal order requires, um, I don't know, like I feel like the maintenance of, of a global order in, requires imperialism, requires the degradation of wage labor in far flung places and at home. So all of that, and that's actually another question for me is could we think about class struggle through the prism of surrogate logic and surrogate victim, like we talked about the deaths of despair, but I'm not sure that like, that might be too loose in applying Gerard, you know? Like, I don't know if that's like actually 
a viable way to to bring his theory into play, right? I don't know. Okay. Girardi and Marxism. <laughs> maybe maybe it can be done, right? I mean, if 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 you can make Heidegger into a left wing philosopher, you can make Girard into a Marxist. If Peter Thiel can do what he, I I watched his uh, video today. I think it's like ten minutes, and he says, "Yeah, Girard helped me in Stanford to be a better rebel, and that's why I made all my money uh, because I knew to go against the herd because I he is like that's his understanding, you know, uh, mimesis is imitation. That that's it." <laughs> oh wow oh wow i can't see this is this is this is this is my like um schadenfreude uh, this is this is what propels me to keep reading gerard these kinds of statements like you know what, what are we doing here we're just trying to crack the code um <laughs> trying to become multi-millionaire hedge fund owners um where can you send that link out oh by the way uh levi did you get a chance to join the slack I actually, I just joined like right before I logged on here. So I'm, I'm hoping to post, yeah, the Levi Strauss stuff as well after. This. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Yeah. And Sean, hopefully you can join it as well. And Kate, I know you're on there, I think. Because yeah, we have a new um, um, uh, working group on um, with Semla Tomshik, which we're really excited about. Hopefully you guys can join that as well. Yeah, I'm pumped. I, I registered for it. I'm excited. Good. Yeah. I, I um. I'm happy that he accepted our offer to to do something, and it's we've put some really good readings together as well for that. It's going to be on resentment and um, antisocial affects, so kind of a um, relevant, but also like I don't know, like um, really. Uh, 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 I think there's a lot that Lacanian psychoanalysis can provide here. Is, is the, the what I'm looking for the most. You know? um, but yeah, you know, I will also confess since I stayed up so freaking late last night, I'm probably at this point um, willing to sort of conclude soon uh, out of sheer exhaustion. Um, but let us plan what we want to read for next time. Let's see here. So, <clears throat> okay. We finished basically uh, chapter two for the most part. Um, now we need to read Oedipus and the Surrogate Victim. So we'll get into that and maybe read the origins of myth and ritual um, and try to get to like page, I don't know, like 120, something like that. So we're at, we're at like 65 right now. Um, could we say get to like 120, 127? Is that too much? The end of chapter four for me is 118. So that's kind of right there. The origins of myth and ritual. Okay, yeah, there you go. That's let's let's try to get to that. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited though to get to like chapter six on the mimetic desire and the monster stubble and mm -hmm. Freud and like you know, I'm really excited to see all this stuff. Yeah. Looks like it's only gonna get better. I have a couple of questions before we move on. <clears throat> One was that that quote about partiality has been my I've been using that um, for years, uh, you know, about how um, a man will always go uh, to the other side, the claiming impartiality, but really just afraid to take a side. And then he says something very interesting. Um, he says that uh, violence begins at the end of reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and <clears throat> I've had uh, varying success, um, like interpreting that. <clears throat> but I, I, I wanted to hear from you guys and women if uh, you know if you had any thought because it's it's very specifically uh, phrased, and uh, it's very very curious to me. Tragedy begins at the point where the illusion of partiality collapses. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. Anybody want to jump in on that? I have some thoughts, but I, this, this way you said about Holderlane, right? Appar apparently, Agamben has a new book on Holderlane. Have you guys ever read um, um, John Laplanche's Holderlane and the Question of the Father? 
It's such an incredible book. It's something I so much recommend to you. It's a study of the psychotic breakdown of that Holderlin had when he moved in with his mother and then wrote upon his psychotic breakdown, one of the most glorious poems of all time called the Hyperion. Hmm. Very fascinating, but he portrays it as a breakdown of the name of the father hmm. around two identifications he had with Fichte and Schelling. <coughs> I think it's Fichte and Schelling, yeah. <coughs> Who are like quasi father figures. One was like, like literally like the father of like order and science and reason. And then the other one was like the father of inspiration and like a mute, like it's very fascinating, but both figures failed him and he fell into a psychosis, right? And this is like Lacan's whole notion of foreclosure of name of the father, right? Mm -hmm. I can't recommend this text enough. I love, I'm in love with it. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see what Agamben says about that. Um, one thing that comes to mind when we're talking about the violence at the end of reason, it's like my first reaction to it was that that sounded, so speaking about German idealists, like a uh, fairly anti-Hegelian. Cause I feel like from the, the Hegelian perspective, even like the large outbursts of violence would still be structured by reason in a certain way. Um, but I also feel like then if you read it as like um, violence as like an imminent endpoint of reason, like either like, um, absolute terror and absolute freedom talking about the French Revolution or even just in when he's talking about in the phenomenology about phrenology and ends it with a little quip about like if, if somebody is speaking about your character in phrenological ways you can kind of bust their head in as an imminent retort to that um yeah. that those images just came to mind as perhaps like a Hegelian integration of that moment by Gerard mm-hmm mm-hmm so before he introduces impartiality, he says this, this German word, uh, gleichweit, is, refers to balance or harmony, by the way. So he says, each side resolutely continues to deploy the same arguments, emphases, goals, and balance in Holderlin's word. Tragedy is the balancing of the scale, not of justice, but of violence. No sooner is something added to one side of the scale than its equivalent is contributed to the other. The same insults and accusations fly from one combatant to the other as a ball flies from one player. Okay. The conflict stretches on interminably because between two adversaries, there is no difference whatsoever. Pure resemblance, right? The equilibrium in the struggle has often been attributed to a so-called tragic impartiality. Holderlin's word is impartiality. <laughs> I do not find this interpretation quite satisfactory. Impartiality implies a deliberate refusal to take sides. The impartial party is not eager to resolve the issue, does not want to know if there's a resolution, nor does he maintain that resolution is impossible. His imp impartiality at any price is not unfrequently simply an unsubstantiated assertion of superiority. So here he says, the self-proclaimed advocate of impartiality does not want to commit himself to either course of action. Um, men always find it distasteful to admit that the reasons on both sides of a dispute are equally valid, which is to say the violence operates without reason. So what's he saying here? Tragedy begins at the point where the illusion of impartiality collapses. Oh, I get it. I get it. That's it right there. You can't have impartiality uh, in a tragic cosmos, right? Because like a relation of impartiality would be one of like, I don't know, like um, tolerance maybe, do you know what I mean? Like, but like if, if Kayim and I are in a tragic duel together, <clears throat> like, we're not impartial. We're not making little uh, concessions to one another. Is that is that, is that is that a fair way to interpret it? But but I wonder if impartiality could be sort of like um, a house um, that you build at, at, and becomes um, an institution, and that's what you do, <clears throat> and sort of that's a way to sacrifice. I'm not going to participate. I'm going to um, sit this one out. I'm going to sacrifice. I don't have to play. I can sacrifice. And it could even become sort of a thing where you avoid tragedy. Right, 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 right. 
Um, right. Preference is registered for one side. That's that's very true. But if you did that, then you wouldn't. But but but, but that 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 actually um, implies that a decision or the act of a decision could uh, fling the subject out of a tragic situation, and that's actually not the case. That's not the case with tragedy, right? This is like the Hamlet condition, right? Yeah. So I don't know. Um, but anyways, Kayam, why don't you jump in here and let us tell us what you're thinking? Oh, yeah. I mean, I spent a couple hours talking about this, but um, I was thinking in terms of the um, the unconscious. And, uh, you know, that, um, like Sean said, you know, we can go for a time uh, and try to avoid uh, these, these conflicts um, present all, all around us or within us. Um, and yet, uh, ultimately, the, 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 you're, 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 you're already doing, right? Um, I claim to be impartial, but my actions speak otherwise. So, I'm, I'm all, so uh, ultimately, I come to see uh, the, uh, the other side of, of, of the truth. And, and yeah. their tragedy. Um, and it's an interesting use of... Uh, uh, the word tragedy. Yeah, we're we're losing our illusions that, uh, right. like Aristotelian or analytic uh, logic, logic is is possible. But he, but we're also losing our identities. I think that's a phrase or a term that will resonate with us because, isn't it funny that. Lacan in particular is somebody who will come around and kind of claim the opposite of what Gerard is saying here about identity in a certain sense, which is, you know, look, the, the problem with identity is that like the human psyche has a really hard time with identifying itself in a full wholeness. And that actually leads to certain violence. And I feel like Gerard's saying the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. I feel like Gerard's actually, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, is very much on the side of let's sell ego psychology, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know. I, 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 I was reading this in like a Lacanian key. To say, you know, he's saying we, we strive for impartiality. We fool ourselves into thinking, um, you know, that we can, uh, we can access ultimate truth. Um, or, or even ultimate desire, ultimate identity, but yet the other continually pokes its finger in our eye, and we and, and we experience the tragedy is also a victory, right? But it's a tragedy that we we lose our our virginity, our our, our naive worldview. Right. That's a very interesting I'll reading. Yeah, I I, I wish I wish I shared that reading. I don't really see it that way because I think that. Once he introduces all this stuff later on distinction and state stability and hierarchy and so on and so forth. And he links that and you think about that in relationship to tragedy. It doesn't seem to me that um, he's, he, that, that what tragedy, the lesson of tragedy that therefore is a lesson um, which is not trying to, we're, we're not, what are we deriving from, from uh, the tragic scenario? We're deriving a negative lesson, right? In the maintenance uh, of, of mimetic contagious violence, right? So I don't know. It's a peripatia, right? Uh, what's the, the other word for um, like uh, anagnoresis that, that it would, uh, Aristotle talks about it in regards to Oedipus. Oh, per the peripatetic? Yeah, it's a sudden, sudden reversal of, of consciousness. Oh, interesting. Hmm. I see what you're analyzing. I see the point at which you're analyzing it. You're analyzing it a kind of um, subjective, a, 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 a subjective level. Well, the, the peripatetic, are, are, isn't that just like the, um, the wandering philosophers or something like that? Um, no, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's anagnoresis and, um, he, peri, 
peripatia um, means it means that uh, you're, you're suddenly you're suddenly like jerked forward into reality, and you lose uh, um, yeah illusions. Yeah. Mm. So right. like here, he brings the example. Oedipus thought that he he was gonna try to be impartial, and suddenly like the scales fell from his eyes, and 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 that for Aristotle is the great the great drama, uh, where there's a sudden shift. Right. Right. So, so keep on going. So what do you see? What else do you see in that? Yeah, so um, I'm not, re it's been, you know, I'm not, I'm not reading it so much in the context of the chapter, um, but, but um, it, you know, it's, this quote is used a lot. And um, the, 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 the zinger for me is um, where he says, that, which is to say that violence operates without reason. <clears throat> That's what brought me into a kind of a psychoanalytic reasoning that we, we can try to, like Sean said, you know, we can try to avoid violence, but violence finds us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's already, so, so the repressed is the, the return of the repressed. Um, in, in terms of, I don't know, is he talking about liberalism uh, throughout? No, mm -hmm. no, uh -uh. no, liberalism would just be kind of one transcendental order, right? Um, hmm. It's just an example. I think that's the nice thing here that he, he gives us a framework, right? So we can then there, therefore apply, apply it to, to any given transcendental order, right? But I see I've looked up uh, Parapeti where it's not exactly a conversion, but it's a kind of moment of, uh, it's, it's kind of like a secularized conversion almost. Because usually you think of like, um, you think of it as a conversionary moment or as an event or something like that, right? Um, or, well, the, the, the term that Plato would also use for it would be, um, uh, 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 a change of heart. What is the what is the um, the Greek term for that? It's it's not it's not a full religious conversion, but it's it's a, a moment in which um, kind of like somebody gives you a, a a nice exposition of an argument, and that causes you to have a change of heart on the issue that you're discussing, right? Not that, right? So that. That's another example that's often cited, but then there is um, an incredible book by, by uh, Slaughterdyke where he analyzes like these different forms of conversion. And he shows that there's kind of like, um, you, can kind of you can kind of reduce conversion to an, an intellectual thing, an intellectual slash emotional kind of thing, but you can also, make conversion into a quasi-political inter-subjective event, right? Where what is at stake and the consequences of this moment for you portends a kind of, I don't know, like a, a connection to something almost ontological in the social fabric. And um, I wonder if this term in, from Aristotle gives us the same, I don't know, breadth, as that, but I'm too tired to uh, retrieve it from my memory at the moment. I need to get a full night's sleep. Did Biden win, by the way? Is it is it over or what? I think it's all over, but the the conclusion. But Biden uh, just has to win. I think Nevada, which he's ahead, and um, all the rest of the polling is coming from Biden heavy places, and there's really not enough to turn it around. So. I think Arizona is going to hold for Biden. And then um, there's some talk that he might even win North Carolina, which I think is a bit of a stretch, but I think he ends up getting exactly 270 according to the math right now. Yeah, that'll be for the best. I mean, you know, the, um, the, the Trump era has just been a disaster. Yeah, I agree. Talk, talk about um, uh, stasis. Right. Yeah. It's yeah.
it's been an infection on our institutions. Okay. I remember I went and I gave a talk. I think Levi, you're at UC Berkeley. I gave a talk at UC Berkeley. And um, uh, anyways, the the group uh, stood up, somebody stood up at the end and of my talk and said, uh, you know, I was really, um, it was really um, unjust that you did not confess to your white privilege before you spoke, right? Mm. Of course. And um, I was like, it was a moment of a kind of, they were, I was, I was, I was in the moment of being canceled. And then like, it kind of went on for a while and it, it became my medic. Like everyone in that audience then had an, uh, their energy shifted to this person that like fully agreed with her. And I, I was sort of uh, kind of hamstrung. It was a very strange moment. I remember going to sleep that night feeling like so much shame in my body so much like dejection so much like so much like um loss of reason you know what i mean in the sense of like there was no ground from which we could um from which anything could be done it was sealed at that moment when she had that um, um, uh, outburst right uh, maybe there was some validity to it i actually later learned that she was uh, that weekend dealing with the death of her mother the woman who stood up and said this because she then started to cry as she was saying it to me and added emotional layer right mm. and it was at that moment i was like this is trumpism right this is the the um the stasis of trumpism whereby there's a kind of um i don't know like the doors open of of a of tension that just in in swarms you know Intention that hardens specific distinctions in certain ways as well. Oh, it's, yeah, that's really nice point too. That goes back, yeah, exactly. It's kind of, yeah, yeah, which is, isn't that the opposite of what Gerard says though? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah. Who knows, right? This is the goes the Bataille thing again. It's like, or or the Zizek thing. Ah, but what if the opposite were true? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, uh, that, that's the only way to read Gerard is to be like like a hysterical Zizekian. <laughs> uh, well, I'm sorry that happened to you, though. I I'd, I'd heard of those things happening at Berkeley, and I actually haven't seen it myself yet. So it's really? just it's wild to hear that. Yeah. No, it's yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, you know, that was the other thing is like, Kyan, when you talk about impartiality, like the only way I survived it psychically was I realized that like, I, it wasn't me. Like I really wasn't, you know what I mean? Like they don't know anything about my commitment to justice. You know what I mean? They don't know anything about like me as a person that was totally neither here nor there, right? right? I was a phantasm. I was a representation of something which I wasn't. Yeah. So that was, I had this uncanny, experience in my hotel room where it was like out of body hmm. it was very weird you know it's very alienating but but maybe alienating in a good way i feel like being alienated like that socially can also produce some insights hmm. for you you know as a person if you or you can fall down a kind of well of resentment or, you know you can take it wrongly you know um but you're you're in, standing in the place of the one who knows uh, and uh, as the authority uh, um, every day as a teacher, right? So this can't be the first time um, you've been scapegoated as the authority. And, it, and it, it also is not, you know, it's not Trump. I mean, it's been, we've been doing this now for a couple decades of, lyn you know, lynching. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, he's, he's, he's created a dynamic whereby it is, it is, um, the contagion reaches and reaches and, and expands, right? And it's 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 more embedded. So he's embedded it. I feel like, and he's and in a weird way, he's negatively legitimated it, right? He's legitimated its spontaneous combustion capacities, right? Um. So I'm I'm happy that that era hopefully will sort of windle down of that. Um, you know of those impulses and those obviously still be yeah, there and yeah risk that we become like egypt or any other basket case country 
who prosecutes the former, I mean, we have to prosecute him if we're gonna to return to law and order. And that's a problem in itself. It's maybe even a, a more contentious problem than, you know, than him being, being in the White House. See, that's an interesting way to look at it. You could also look at Trump as a vanishing mediator, which is how I would prefer to look at it, which is that no, like actually it's not, we don't need a substantial resolution with his illicit corruption. Why? Because it's well known that every politician is corrupt. I mean, look at the, the Hunter Biden thing. And I know that, you know, liberal echo chambers, but like, dude, I mean, this, this kid was making $300,000 a month from some Ukrainian gas company. Give me a fucking break. <laughs> so, um, so people don't make $300,000 in 10 years. Right. So, um, it's for that reason he's a vanishing mediator because the whole thing of Trumpism was the, 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 the activation of the underclass, right? That the fact that he was able to go in there and, and he let them down and it was tragic and so on, but they made him possible. Um, and, you know, I think historically that's like the moment that's most significant. And the second moment for me that's most significant is what he makes possible for authoritarianism in the future. He opens the, the door for a true fascist to emerge. Oh, yeah. That's the, the other thing that I'm really worried about. But. And I, I, wanted to, I know you want to wrap up. I, I, you said in the, from the, in the beginning, for whom is the absolute accessible? Uh, that sounds like very Levinasian, you know, so you're not really, we're not going to remark on the nature of contradiction or truth or whatever. We're not even going to build up a metaphysics, right? We're, we're, we're going to uh, speak from the place of the other. Is, is that, that's how I hear you. But I know you've spoken about this many times before. Mm. That's beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Oh my God. Wow. Now you've really, you really got it going now. Um, well, I mean, oh, oh, if I could just put one quick contrarian thought out there. Um, yeah. It's just uh, uh, how much I've been thinking recently of Baudrillard on Watergate. Um, if we're talking like uh, the sort of return to normalcy sort of stuff. Uh, uh, if anybody's familiar with that, he, he has a, a good can you, writing. Can you give us a rundown on that? Yeah, yeah, he relates uh, Watergate to Disney World or Disneyland and where, uh, so like Disneyland is like this uh, space of almost like the pure imaginary that then like forecloses the use of the imaginary in everyday life. And I think he does a similar thing with like uh, natural parks. And then he interprets Watergate as this sort of spe spectacularized uh, uh, moment of like and produced in the same way as natural parks or disney world of like this made obscene corruption that now you know after woodward and bernstein like now we're done with this and that's gone and this isn't part of the everyday fabric of our back of our of our of our lives and of our political structures mm. uh mm. it's to me a lot of it seems like and why so much of the security state apparatus uh endorsed biden was it's it's a seems like a strong project in the re-legitimacy of what the last 30 years has been yeah. Mm. So what you're saying there to Kaim's point is that Baudrillard would kind of stress that the the atonement uh, does not necessitate uh, a, a material sacrifice from Trump vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the judiciary or something like that. Is that what you're saying that like in Baudrillard's sense, like the simulacrum does the work for you or like that we're kind of removed from the necessity to, I don't know, like get revenge on Trump or something like that. Is that what you're saying? Like, I don't know. Like I'm, the atonement being like part of a, almost like a natural cycle of, of contemporary politics um, where it, it, it almost in a, in a certain way renormalizes that excessive point of Trump as another inevitability to come about since you're not dealing uh, with the antagonisms yeah. and this, yeah. this is an old yeah. line that produce him in a certain way I, th I like that line of inquiry i like that a lot uh, i think it's funny too it's almost like trump is even more corrupt than the politicians so it's like he says he's an outsider but actually he's really a hidden insider he's yeah. really the most yeah. corrupt of yeah. all yeah 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 well look i mean we have some real thinking to do because last night was was remarkable that um 
we 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 need to understand how in the fuck this uh, coalition was able to sustain itself, right? I mean, did you notice the the Lincoln Project? They spent I don't know hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Did you did you see the the numbers on Republicans? It was yeah. It was it was, it was like ninety three percent of Republicans this time around voted for Trump, even though not that there was a lower percentage only like 90 percent voted for him in 2016. And while you, you could attribute yeah. that to like some of the republicans who left the party being independents or democrats now but at the same time it's still not an impressive statistic it's very interesting i think it's very interesting because i think what it showed was that trumpism became remember uh james burnham one of the great conservative American intellectuals of the post-war period. What was the what was the basis of his critique? There's a whole line of fascism that follows in its stead, which is that fascism is around a critique of of, of bureaucracy and of elites, mm. and, and that uh, if you read the birth of fascist ideology by the uh, Israeli historian Zev Sternhell. He makes that claim. He says, look, fascism emerged out of social syndicalism, particularly Sorel, who came up with the idea that because class struggle in the factory floor was so impossible to actually progress justice for workers, um, he adopted the idea that the task must be to overthrow the bureaucracy and introduce kind of new elites. And anyways, uh, that idea has been very sexy for the American right. And so I really think that Trumpism, um, to the extent that it is fascist, like you have a kind of line of thinking of fascism qua critique of elites. And I think that um, the true elites of the Republican Party that voted for Trump now, they found that all of that stuff that he does against elites, the kind of huff and puff, the Twitter and the, 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 the provocative language, they really see it as innocuous. That's the thing that a lot of people don't realize. All of those uh, evangelicals, they just don't give a shit about the, um, mm. the the owning of the libs. They don't care about owning the libs. Like, and even I notice in my neighborhood, African American people who support Trump. I live in an all black neighborhood, pretty much. They don't care about owning the libs. This whole thing of owning the liberals is a very specific problem for like the educated managerial class but nobody else really cares or even <laughs> that, that presupposes that you even know what liberalism is and like that's a question you know what i mean like it's 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 very um heterogeneous yeah uh, it's it's a problem for the educated and for the online i don't know if it's like that much of an issue to people outside of certain of, outside of those two circles right right so anyways but so you know what i mean though you guys agree there's a lot of thinking to do on what the hell happened last night Let's yeah. not count our chickens yet. Huh? Let's not count our chickens. I'm not, I'm not, I, no, I have no idea what's going to happen next. No one does. Oh, yeah, yeah. because you might take it to court. You can tell Trump, Trump is making friends with Arizona quickly and like the Republican <laughs> structure to be like, help me out here. Like, what can we do to like throw a wrench in this? And he's already tried to sue a couple places, so they stopped counting the ballots. Mm -hmm. Right. Why so, that's in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my friends, this has been fun. Um, mm -hmm. So next week, if somebody else might be willing to take on some of the facilitating tasks, I would appreciate it only because I am preparing for another presentation the day after. So I'm going to be kind of um, our first meeting in the um, politics of resentment group. So I'll be, you know what I'm saying? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to some of you and, and peer pressure you to uh, help. <laughs> it's not too much, you know, just identify passages that you want to talk about and just have a conversation, right? And, so and I have a question too. I don't have an answer for you, but I have another question of the, the group that you're going to meet on Thursday. Yeah. Is there yeah. a way that you can send me an invite or is there yeah. a way to sign up for that? You're on Twitter, right? Yeah. Just go to my Twitter page. It's the pinned tweet at the top. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, my friends. Well, best of luck for the uh, the good of, of everyone. And uh, 
yeah, Levi, I hope you can share the, your, your comments on Levi Strauss. And yes. also, if you find anything on Gerard and Bataille, post that as well, if you don't mind. Oh, do. and I will post the Jillian Rose essay on Gerard, which maybe in a few sessions, we can read that together and talk about it because it introduces that whole Gnosticism business, which we should look at. Can yeah. you post your, uh, your notes in the, uh, your slides in the uh, Slack? Sure. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thank all you all. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank one. Thank you.